first session, the 20 minute talk, followed by 10 minute uh, questions and discussion. Uh, the first speaker is Dr. Nawal Hassan Gulli, who is a professor in theory and critical theory and gender and uh, women's studies at the American University of Georgia. <coughs> Uh, Hassan Gulli is the author of Reading Arab Women's Autobiographies, Shara Zed Tells Her, editor of Arab Women's Lives Retold, Exploring Identity Through Writing, and co-editor of Mapping Arab Women's Movements, A Century of Transformations from Within, and guest editor of Hawa, Journal of Women of the Middle East and the Islamic World. Uh, in both her research and teaching, uh, Hassan Goli adopts interdisciplinary approaches in her teaching and research drawing, drawing on her interests in critical and literary theory, autobiography theory, cognitive theory, literary theory, post-colonial literatures and discourses, feminism, and Arab women's writings. Uh, Professor Goli uh, is going to present a paper titled, My Travels Around the World, a Narrative of Freedom, Mobility, and Connection. Uh, thank you, Hazard. Thank you very much. And thank you, everybody, for being here. And thank you for the organizers, uh, and there are many, uh, of this uh, great uh, uh, project, uh, this conference on uh, storytelling and travel writing and seafaring. Um, uh, my contribution to, um, to this conference is um, a short version of a longer study of a travel book by uh, a great uh, writer uh, that, um, uh, who actually wrote a travel book. So she has her own travel account. So I called uh, the title of my uh, talk, My Travels Around the World, which is the title of the book, A Narrative of Freedom, Mobility, and Connection. So when we speak of travel and mobility, especially in relation to women, we usually think of modern times. We do so because we assume that women have obtained the freedom to be mobile as a result of recent development that challenge patriarchal systems that have governed the human societies for a long time. Indeed, the long persistence of patriarchy in our modern history has left us with a misconception or even with misconceptions about social and cultural structures. Some tend to think, that, uh, think of patriarchy, which is the patrilineal arrangement of human societies under systems in which males hold primary power and predominate in roles of political leadership, moral authority, and social privilege, uh, and control of property. They, they tend to think of this system as essentially universal, ahistorical, and as ancient as we are. As a result, as a result to uh, this mis misunderstanding, the concept that men uh, may stay at home while independent women venture out into the world is considered a rather modern phenomenon. Well, some of you know that I teach women's studies here at AUS and I can see some of my uh, excellent students here. So in women's studies classes, we necessarily refute such misunderstanding. And the students and I are always on the lookout for relevant evidence to contest the unconceived linearity of patriarchy. I recently came across such evidence that is related to the theme of travel. So German archeologists examined the remains of 84 people buried between uh, 2500 and 1650 uh, uh, BC, <coughs> discovering that at the end of the Stone Age and in the early Bronze Age, families were established in a surprising manner. The study, which was, uh, came out September 2017, suggests that, in fact, the practice of women's travel was rooted in ancient times, when Bronze Age men stayed at home, while adventurous women were the key to spreading culture and ideas. 
The research reveals that over a period of some 800 years, European women traveled between 300 kilometers and 500 kilometers from their home villages to start families, while men tended to stay near where they were born. It seems then that women travelers have a much longer history than thought previously. <coughs> well, the traveler that I will be speaking of is hardly ancient. She's still alive today. She is one of our own time, Nawal Sadawi. Uh, while this ancient tradition might be too remote to contextualize the tradition that I just talked about, while it must be too uh, remote to contextualize her writings, a long and more recent history of travel writing predominantly by men, starting with the Arab Islamic medieval <coughs> Ibn Battuta, which many people are aware of, provides a greater context, but this is beyond the realm of my presentation today. For those, for those who have not heard of Nawal Sadawi, she is a prolific Egyptian writer, feminist, pioneer feminist that is, an activist, whose works, both fictional and analytical, have been translated into over 30 languages. Born in 1931 in a little village, Kafur Tahla, in the Egyptian <coughs> Delta, she was brought up in Cairo by parents of two different classes. Her father was an only son to his poor mother who sacrificed for his education while not being able to do the same for her daughters. Sa'dawi's mother, on the other hand, was a Korean upper class woman. Sa'dawi developed her gender consciousness, along with her class consciousness, both of which are present in all of her writings. Al Sadawi was educated at Cairo <coughs> University, at Columbia University in New York, and also at Ain Shams University. Um, in 1955, she worked as, an, as, a, as a physician at Cairo University and in the Egyptian Ministry of Health and became the Director General of the Health Education Department within the ministry. In, in 1968, she founded Health Magazine, which was later shut down by the Egyptian authorities. And in 1972, she was expelled from her professional position in the Ministry of Health because of her book titled Al Mar'a Wal Jins, 1969 in Arabic, Women and Sex, in English, 1972, which was condemned by religious and political authorities. Al Sadawi was jailed in September 1981, and during her imprisonment, she wrote Mudakarati Min Sijn al Nisa, My Memoirs from the Women's Prison. Sadawi dedicated her life to writing on and campaigning for women's rights, as I just said. The science of the body, though, had always been an important force in her writing. In her work, medicine allows the female physician, who she is, to question games of power and social hierarchy. Sometimes described as the Simone de Beauvoir of the Arab world, she is the founder and president of the Arab Women's Solidarity Association and co-founder of the Arab Association for Human Rights. Now, the first association was also closed by the Egyptian authorities and shut down the magazines that used to be, she used to edit out of that association. She has been awarded honorary degrees from different great universities in the world, received many international awards, and held visiting academic positions in prestigious universities in Europe and North America. She is the author of around 50 works, including fiction and nonfiction, memoirs, novels, short stories, and even plays, often containing subject matter considered controversial. Her words have been translated into, as I said, more than 30 languages, and some of them are taught in a number of universities in different countries. In her writings, she challenges the status quo of patriarchal, religious, and capitalist power structures. Amongst her works is the travel book titled Rahalati Hawla Al Alam when it came out in Arabic and then it came out in English as my travels in the world as in this volume. 
which records her impressions of and experiences in the various countries she traveled in. She first departs from her homeland, this is her own word, to attend a medical conference in Algeria. Then it is on to Europe, the United States, uh, followed by Jordan, a stop in Helsinki, and a visit to the Soviet Union, and Central Asia come next, and then Iran. A long visit to India, and then travels in East and West Africa, ending her travel account with a conversation on politics and colonialism with the Senegalese writer and filmmaker Osman Sembel at Dakar Airport. Now the structure of the book, a little bit about the structure of the book. The original travels, which was, as I said, came out in Arabic in 86, was produced in two volumes, published one month apart. While the English translation came out in one volume in 91, put the two volumes together, and a lot of editorial interference by uh, the editors, and an introduction written especially for that volume by Saadawi. The travel account covers her travels over the 50s and the 60s. So as you can, uh, the 60s, uh, I'm sorry, the 60s and the 70s. After she had graduated and was able then to travel as a, a doctor and also for her postgraduate uh, studies. The structure within each chapter, however, is not as simple as the structure of the book, which is chronological. It follows her travels from the first trip on. Travel usually refers to movement in space. In Saadawi's travels, there is also a nonlinear movement in time. That is within each chapter. The chapter itself doesn't necessarily follow the chronological sequence of the trip she is covered. It is in the nature of most travel narratives to focus on the relationship between the subject and the object, <coughs> that is between the traveler, the people, and the landscape. A narrative of freedom and great motion, my travels around the world is an ideal text for studying the development of subjectivity. In this travel narrative, Saadawi, in, by Saadawi, there is a great emergence of self from seclusion and an attempt to identify the self with an ever greater range of others in different societies in the globe. Zadawi's book is an autobiographical text which includes aspects of personal relations and self-revelation and representation. Without ignoring the literariness of the book, My Travels Around the World, a, hi uh, a highly analytical, reflective, and autobiographical narrative is a new mode of writing about the self, a mode not yet tried by many Arab women writers in the book at, the, at the time. In the book, Saadawi reflects on her personal experience while analyzing <coughs> political, social, economic, and cultural aspects of the countries she visits. My travels around the world, therefore, <coughs> serves not only to reveal information about various countries and peoples, as most travel books do, but also to uncover a culturally determined subjectivity of the traveler in her quest for a transnational identity. On the importance of travel, an outline of the different, uh, I've already spoken about the structure. I'll talk a little bit about the importance of travel as for Saadawi and as in her book. The introduction to the English translation highlights a clear political extension to travels and prompts a political reading of the book throughout. What was the dream of my life, she wrote. I would see myself on a white horse, flying in the air, and in my hand a sword with which I would strike enemies and liberate my homeland. Thus does Saadawi link the world of travel to that of politics and eventually gender in the opening pages of the book. Not unlike other of her works, her travel memoirs are far from innocent documentaries. The boundaries Saadawi crosses are not merely geographical, but literal, literary and political, making her book a narrative of freedom, mobility, connections, and transgression, transgression at once. At the end of chapter one of the Arabic book Saadawi wrote, I began to realize that traveling outside the homeland is necessary not only to know other countries and other peoples, but to know who I am and who we are. 
for knowing the self can only be achieved in the light of knowing the others. In addition to knowing the self as a purpose for her travels and writing about her travels, according to Sadawi, quote, we see our homeland more clearly when we are away from it than when we are in it. I have seen many positives and negatives in the East and the West, which have revealed some of the positives and negatives within my own homeland. Now, the homeland, you've heard me using it a number of times. This is her word, Egypt. As an Arab country, is put the context of East versus West. For the introduction goes on to give a prime political reason for travel in the sense of intellectual recognition of the position of one's own culture and the wider Arab world. It is no accident that Sadawi has politicized the reading of her book. For when she wrote the introduction to the English version in 1990, the USA and its allies were preparing to attack Iraq after the invasion of Kuwait. Sadawi was among the many Arabs who felt that the war should be avoided by peaceful negotiation with Saddam Hussein and the invasion should be contained within the realm of the Arab countries alone. In fact, she was one of the a, a delegation of nine women to Iraq in an attempt to reach some kind of agreement with Hussein. She also supported an international women's initiative for peace in the Gulf and went to New York and accompanied the United Nations Secretary General on a two-week tour of the United States designed to rally support for an end to the war and creating just peace in its aftermath. With her, with her actions and outspokenness, Saadawi's travels and other works should always be read in the context of her politics. Saadawi, like many other writers whose opposition <coughs> politics is made public, has suffered from censorship, has suffered from censorship, including <coughs> travel itself, travel, the travel book itself. Like all my writing has been subject to the censors, scissors, as she calls them, or publishing difficulties and restrictions. Sadawi speaks of censorship against censorship on every occasion. In reading travel as a journey to the self and to the wider human world, two motifs recur throughout the book, the mirror and the border crossing. The two motifs are connected, for Sadawi travels out of a double desire to, re to, re to rediscover self through understanding the other and to cross the border of her own country. On the first motif, country which she calls a prison, by the way. Uh, so she talks about it only in order to um, uh, escape that prison that she calls the big prison of Egypt. On the first motif, through the looking glass, travel writing uses the other countries as mirrors in which to find one's own country and self. Sadawi travels to different countries in an, as an Egyptian. That is, every time she's introduced to a new culture, she refers back to her Egypt and sees it in a new light. She travels in order to rediscover herself and establish <coughs> new images about herself or herself. Or she travels as a woman, uh, she travels as a woman doctor, as a feminist, as a writer, as a United Nations delegate. She travels to attend medical uh, courses and participate in feminist conferences. She travels for different reasons, but always as a woman, except when she chooses to cross, the uh, she cross um, uh, and disguises herself in men's clothing in Bangkok in order to see uh, what goes on in a parlor in Bangkok. <laughs> Travel for Sadawi is not flying in planes, visiting museums, sleeping and eating in luxury hotels. It is, quote, walking around the streets on dusty quarters, discovering people everywhere, especially in those places from which tourists run or where they put their handkerchiefs to their noses should they happen to pass by. Wherever she goes, Egypt and Egyptian children, women and men, are recalled to be compared and contrasted with the journey she is in and its people. Initially, this might seem odd for someone who always longed to travel beyond the borders of her homeland prison. My life's dream was flight and escape from prison. 
However, Sa'dawi's desire to escape the borders of her country is like her recurrent dream, childhood dream, that her father was dead, and later in her youth, her husband was dead or has died. It was a desire for freedom. Although she loved her father, it was the concept of the father as a tyrant that she wished dead. Similarly, she loved Egypt, her homeland, but wished to escape the tyranny of the regime. When she was asked once where, uh, how she could bear to live in Egypt, she said she believed passionately in her country. She did not know the agony and the pain of other people as she did those of Egyptian people. While studying in Raleigh, in North Carolina, she traveled to Chicago to attend a conference of the Arab Students Organization at the University of Illinois. She found herself standing with 700 students singing an Arab patriotic song in unison. This love-hate relationship with her country traveled with her everywhere she went. She wanted to leave the country forever, but every time she left, she went back to Egypt again. With every trip abroad, I thought I would not return, but I did, every time. The desire to escape, but also to, be, to belong, explains Saadawi's position, not just as a traveler, but as a mother too. Although being a mother had provided her with feelings that nothing else, quote, no man, nor work, or a travel could. It also meant that there were limits to how far she could go in other fields of life. My longing for my daughter was as contradictory as my longing for the homeland. The desire to belong only equaled by the desire to escape. Thus for Sadawi, traveling beyond <coughs> the borders of the homeland is not necessary an escape in the negative sense of the word. Distance, she realizes after traveling, makes the heart grow fonder. Seeing other parts of the, of the world and living outside Egypt enab enabled her to know Egypt better and love it more. Lo living, uh, living away from her husband every now and then also made her think that marital relationships were happier if husbands and wives lived apart. Distance weakens the fragile marital relationships but strengthens firm ones based on feelings of true love, mutual respect, and understanding. So now we saw Egypt in India. From the very moment she landed in the airport of New Delhi, she saw Egyptian faces in the faces of the poor Indian porters. In India, she was always reminded of Egypt and of Egyptian people. She felt as though I were not in India, but in Egypt. Despite superficial differences, there was a sort of strange resemblance, as though roots were the same. Not only people, but also the landscape and the climate always evoked memories of Egypt. The Algerian mountains reminded Saadawi. Uh oh, I'm told to shut up. I still have quite a bit. Can I conclude then? I'm sorry, that's going to make the scene uh, incoherent, though. For the sake of discussion, I believe you can take two minutes. Maybe, uh, maybe from the questions, I might be able to do as well. So my conclusion is from private self to public persona. Uh, as I said, the travel book covers the uh, 60s and the 70s. So when she started traveling, she was still like uh, a graduate, a new graduate, and just started her career. So she was still not known, maybe in a little way within Egypt, but not outside. But by the end of the 70s, uh, her work started being translated, so she acquired a, a, a bit of fame. So she, she built this kind of public persona. So an analysis of the uh, travels, uh, uh, the book, shows a shift in Saadaw's, like, uh, analysis of the book as a whole, shows a shift in Saadaw's narrative and language from beginning to end, as she gradually develops into some kind of celebrity. Her narrative moves from being highly personal to becoming more generalized. The parts that cover her early trips during which she had not yet become known outside Egypt are more concerned with the self and its creation. As such, these parts are structured in a sophisticated way around a multiplicity of themes, such as life and death, fight and prison, uh, flight and prison, fatherhood, motherhood, wifehood, 
all woven in a canvas of dreams and fantasies. The other parts, which cover her later trips, when she became more or less international figure, are less introspective. The self-mobilization, the self-creation, and self-questioning, which characterize the first part, uh, uh, are less dominant in, in the second part. The self becomes less fluid and more of a fixed persona. Saadawi becomes more self-confident, her tone is more assured. So the move in tone in the narrative from being personal, self-reflective, and analytical to becoming more political, self-assured, and descriptive can be said to mark Saadawi's transformation into a public figure. The self that she tries to discover and construct in the first half of the book seems to be lost behind the public persona in the second half. Paradoxically, she, become, she becomes at once more self-assertive, yet less concerned with self-exploration, and is more turned outward toward concern for other people and for the surroundings. Indeed, the narrative in Travels reflects the tension between personal and public identities. The Arab or Egyptian identity that she carries with her everywhere does not take over other identities that Saadawi seems to be willing to embrace. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Goli, for uh, providing us with another facet of Saadawi's uh, work, uh, a facet which is not very much assessed. Um, Questions ta question time? Any question? For right. Yes, please. Thank you, Noah. Um, for my students, can you talk a little bit about some of those identities that she was trying to embrace other than her Egyptian identity? Her Arab identity? Yeah, I have that you know, long part section where I'm looking at how she identifies with. Uh, for example, exa I mentioned one example of her identification with uh, international Amer Arab American students, but then in other parts she, is, she finds herself uh, making friends with people from France, from uh, the States, from Finland, from uh, African countries, Asian countries, that she thought she would never be able to, to do. And she, she started you know, affiliating with them and understanding there is uh, you know, no border can stop her from identifying with these people with whom she uh, felt there is intellectual reson resonance. Right. Uh, if there is no other question, I have one. Okay, go ahead, please. Uh, the last uh, interview. Probably we should need uh, that. We cannot hear you. I cannot. Okay. Maybe can or can we leave? Or we can just come here. Or we just wait for them to leave and close the door, please. These are students who have classes, so they can. Yeah, I, yeah, I do understand. Uh, yeah. I understand. Now I believe that you can shout. <laughs> yeah, okay. Just uh, talking about the last interview. You said I'm from the Netherlands. The last interview was a little bit shocking. Um, <coughs> yeah, I can't comment on it. I've just been told about it uh, by uh, yeah, my yeah. colleague here. I haven't heard it, so I can't really uh, okay. comment yeah. unless I hear. Um, From what I heard, I mean, it is shocking. It's unbelievable. But I would like to wait until I hear it with my own ears. <laughs> okay. Yeah, thank you. But was it in the political scene in Egypt? Yeah, exactly. and, OK. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. I mean, words? it's shocking because she was with the young people in Tahrir Square in, in the revolution. <laughs> Late at night, she would be with them. Exactly. So I will be surprised to hear anything funny or stupid uh, coming out of exactly. that. So I don't know. Right. Perhaps I thought it's uh, like a film. Uh, somebody did it for her. Uh, yeah. It's not 100% for her. But yeah, I, I will be very surprised to hear that yeah. she would say anything not, not Nawal Sa'ad that way. Yeah. Okay. Right, I have a question uh, concerning uh, Sadawi's visibility and, and uh, circulation or circulation yes. of her words. Um, I just need to know uh, what you think about um, a type of a charge against Sadawi and against many other uh, Arab feminists uh, concerning this specific question of visibility, which makes uh, these uh, 
Arab writers or feminists uh, marketable figures, uh, a type of a cultural informant and Spivak's word, word, word. Um, I wonder whether also Zadewi, uh, well, whether Zadewi has questioned uh, her position in this global system of visibility and marketability. Indeed, um, yes, I understand. It's, it's a dilemma for uh, many of us who, uh, including myself and in my own work, in my own writing, I always, you know, um, so uh, concerned and worried about how I'm going to be seen in relation to the culture that I'm critiquing and analyzing. I am an insider looking at a culture that is not immune to criticism as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, yet, yet when you do that, you are always accused of how can you? Yeah? So I, th I think many writers who, who, do, uh, who engage in cultural critiques of their own, uh, say where they come from, can be faced with this charge. Uh, so I don't know what we can do about it, except that if you are uh, analyzing for the sake of understanding and for the sake of making up for, for what you, d you don't see to be right, then I, I don't know if, if we can stop that. Uh, because people are, are uh, charged or accused of uh, criticism for the sake of criticism. Yeah. Well, I don't think Noat Sadawi, you know, her work fits that. She is not criticizing, she is critiquing for the sake of reconstructing, for the sake of understanding. Yeah. And she does talk about good things and, you know, the good, the bad and the ugly. She's not always looking at the, at the bad side of Egypt or of our uh, of Arab countries. And as for her realization, I, 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 I think, yes, she is. She is aware. And yet, uh, what I respect about her, that she's, she's still brave enough to maintain her uh, position. And this is why I'm surprised to hear that she said anything, uh, you know, funny. Uh, that th this is why wh who I am, and this is what I am. I'm proud of where I come from, of the culture I belong to. But I know my culture, like any other culture, has uh, practices that we are not proud of, as simple as that. I mean, she was instrumental in making the Egyptian uh, 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 government think twice about the issue of female genital mutilation, uh, about honor killing, and about so many issues that we know they exist. So who are we fooling? Yeah. <coughs> Thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you. Second speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Altarid Haider uh, from Oxford University. Uh, Dr. Haider, Haider is uh, specialized in Arabic and comparative literature, media, and literary theory, and a member of the academic teaching and research staff of the Arabic subject group at the Faculty of Oriental Studies, University of Oxford. She taught and lectured at other universities and institutions and has researched and published on Arabic literature, media, and cultural history, personal, uh, sorry, and Arabic uh, and cultural history. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Haider, uh, Haider's paper is titled Early Syrian American Immigrants, Trans Transatlantic Voyages and uh, Stories. <laughs> thank you very much, and thank you for uh, the organizers and the audience. Uh, I'm speaking about uh, yes, this subject. So, uh, uh, narratives and accounts of uh, travels in general and immigration and resettlement are part of the cultural history and national historiography of all communities and countries, especially young nations such as the New World. Uh, both intellectual and popular world uh, culture witnessed in the last few decades an upsurge in, inter uh, in interest in uh, writing and reading narratives about travel and travelers, mainly due to the development of uh, tourism, uh, intensification of immigration and displacement, and expansion of communication technologies. Arab Americans, like all other communities, endeavor to write their uh, history, which extends about two centuries. However, scholars who research the first intensive mass migration uh, between 1880 uh, 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 to 1920, uh, which is called the first wave, they find th themselves ex excavating a predominantly Syrian territory because almost all Arabs who lived in America before 1920 um, uh, immigrated from historical Syria or greater Syria or Bilad uh, and mainly from modern Syria and Lebanon. Um, hence, uh, every book that relates the story of Arab Americans will have its first part that extends more than half a century, mainly revolving around Syrian immigrants. 
What is the recent century of Arab Americans, including the Syrians, has relatively received uh, um, and still receiving uh, good attention in academia and publishing, the previous century is still a gray area with many undefined zones. In comparison to other nationalities and ethnic groups of early immigrants, early Arab uh, immigration uh, history, which is here Syrian, uh, is one of the least documented and is still to be researched. Otherwise, the unfinished historiography of early Syrian Americans uh, is a lost op uh, episode in the history of Arab Americans and even of the American history as a whole. The studies about uh, Syrian um, uh, uh, early immigrants expanded in recent uh, decades and the authors enjoyed wide readership. Uh, however, this task was faced by difficulties because of the shortage of information about these points in the experience of early um, immigrants, uh, which I uh, summarize them as this. Um, so uh, the, the, um, uh, in the reconstruction, these are the missing episodes. Uh, the original context and motivation in their home countries, the trip, the arrival, and the first stage of resettlement in their new homes. Uh, these parts uh, were always difficult to reconstruct because of many obstacles that uh, can be categorized as follows. The first one is the scarcity of official records, reports, documentation, and the chronicles that preserve the necessary data due to many reasons. The biggest uh, reason is, um, uh, one of the biggest reasons uh, or the biggest incidents was the loss and destruction of most records of first uh, Ellis Island immigration station, which was the main gateway for uh, newcomers. Uh, in uh, uh, 1897, a fire of unknown origin um, turned the wooden structure of Ellis Island into ashes, and most of the immigration reports after uh, 1855 were destroyed. Ellis Island is a central theme in all narratives that followed um, the, uh, the immigrant stories of arrival and uh, uh, in their new home. Um, the second reason, shortage of written personal narratives about individuals and groups that include relevant information, including memoirs, diaries, biographies, and autobiographies, and family histories that include relevant information about early Syrian immigrants because of lack of resources and difficulty of social and cultural organization among Syrian immigrants, fleeing civil uh, conflicts and economic hardship at home and in early stage of resettling, mostly working as peddlers, uh, or traveling uh, salesmen. Yeah, the peddlers are the uh, uh, salesmen in the street. You can see in that uh, picture. This is very important, uh, also seen in um, in um, uh, Arab American uh, literature. The third um, uh, reason is the decline of Syrian areas of concentration and social grounds of central exchange and daily interaction that preserve their culture. The demographic changes in American cities uh, during mid 20th uh, century. Uh, 20th century were um, accompanied by the demolition of many Syrian areas of concentrations which housed <coughs> vibrant social grounds that provided meeting places for cultural exchange and daily interaction between them. The most vital among these grounds were was the area known as Little Syria in Manhattan uh, and also called the Syrian Quarter. Uh, it was the biggest uh, of several ones called the Syrian colonies. Uh, it was um, uh, the res residential um, area of early Syrian immigrants and was a lively shopping area uh, full of cafes, restaurants, and cultural centers. These places of sociability in little Syria were the reservoir of their oral culture and popular tradition for decades. The uh, last uh, and the fourth uh, reason is the difficulty of tracing back, back the roots of the uh, family history of early ones due to many reasons, uh, including assimilation, return to uh, uh, home uh, countries, and registration uh, under uh, Beirut and Tripoli port cities of departure. Uh, another reason, which was highlighted by the historian um, uh, uh, Gregor, uh, Gregory uh, Orfeli, is the inclination among the early Syrian immigrants to be discreet and low profile to avoid uh, discrimination for political reasons. Uh, the following section will examine how the uh, major um, uh, sources by specialists in uh, the field relied on other sources to write their history. Uh, in uh, historical studies, uh, the first academic research in the field was written by the renowned uh, um, uh, American syro lebanese historian, Philip Hitti. It's called The Syrians in America, uh, 1924. It is still the most significant book on Syrian Americans, and it laid the groundwork for subsequent research on Arab Americans in general. 
In many places in the book, Hitti resorted to folk songs, stories, um, uh, um, uh, memo uh, memories, etc., to support his argument. In the following parts, Hitti analyzes the motivation of uh, immigration. Um, in the chapter titled uh, Education, he relates stories about the Ottoman official restrictions on education. And he narrates, he usually always start is illustrated in the story. So this is very repetitive um, uh, 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 phrase in his book. Uh, always, uh, he's putting story and he, he, he will describe something and he'll say it's uh, illustrated by the story of da da da. The wording of the narration highlights the uh, a, a pioneering attempt to extend the ability of the historical discussion to involve various unconventional sources and narrative systems. The uh, uh, recurrence of this uh, phrase, as I said, also demonstrates the, the power of storytelling to maintain information and support argument. Um, Sometimes Hitti turns into fine universal storyteller. The stories of early Im uh, immigrants whom Hitti calls sons of Syria, uh, it, it means uh, historical Syria, are sometimes presented in a comparative light as part of the world culture. He is, he, as you see, he compared it to, um, uh, he said, the romantic story of uh, Garfield and Earl Lincoln. So he repeats the story when he's telling history. He's uh, not all historians at that time, they would do that. Uh, also, he um, uh, sometimes he uh, sometimes will go to uh, little Syria to uh, collect uh, um, uh, stories from the peddlers, and also when there are problems, he will he will not only collect stories, but he he will also compare them to media and even sometimes to the court um, uh, records and police records, like when there was a, a big riot uh, around, uh, uh, including in uh, little Syria in 1905. Uh, so he uh, compared the stories with the official reports. Hitti also examines close, uh, closely the letters exchanged between immigrants and their communities. So he'll see also the uh, stories traveling between the um, uh, two uh, uh, countries. Uh, fabricated stories of thriving uh, business, success, and the quick wealth. This is typical of uh, uh, immigrants. Uh, traveled back in the post, uh, crossing the, the nation towards families and friends in Syrian hometowns. He also uh, describes, uh, the, describes the mode of reception of these stories and maintains uh, the storytelling devices and uses metaphoric language. You see, this uh, yeah, spreading like a wildfire, he will say about uh, these stories. Sometimes he explains historical facts and calls them uh, thrilling stories. Uh, he will, uh, like when he, he uh, told the uh, uh, story of the first uh, Syrian immigrant, he said the first Syrian immigrant was uh, Lebanese, uh, Antonis, in 1854. Uh, at that time, they thought he's the first, but then I think they, it was discovered that there's still more um, before. Um, so uh, sometimes also he will, uh, sometimes uh, Hitti uh, defines um, uh, also facts by uh, folk songs, narrative uh, folk songs that narrate. Uh, also a story, here is the story of, uh, he, he called this, he said, this is my uh, fa favorite song. <coughs> and he said it was very popular in the 19th century. Uh, it is a narrative song um, uh, of a woman whose husband uh, went to Damascus, which was considered to be a very yeah, story, of, uh, magic story, a magic uh, city uh, full of um, uh, ex uh, excitement, etc. So uh, people will be warned, um, yes, because he traveled from alone, from Leban Le the Lebanese mountain to Damascus. Um, uh, the, um, also, uh, stories from Ellis Island. So this is one of the main episodes missing in the uh, history, and uh, he has lots of stories coming from um, uh, Ellis Island. Uh, he always includes um, uh, enough information about the sources of his stories also, but it's clear that his book reserved some of the lost data of the trip uh, and arrival at um, uh, Ellis Island. So this is a, a story of um, a man who uh, swim, who he, he was uh, uh, paddled, I think swimming, or uh, from the, um, uh, though he has broken arm uh, to uh, New Jersey shore, and he, he risked his life for liberty. Uh, more of uh, Ellis Island, uh, Roosevelt, and the two Syrian boys. So you can uh, read the story, very interesting story. Uh, uh, usually, uh, early immigrants, they were always uh, associated with certain illness to uh, when they were sent back. So in the Syrian, um, historical Syria, apparently there was trachoma. So most people who were sent back, they were, um, uh, suspected of having a trachoma, which is eye disease. And uh, the uh, two children uh, were uh, suspected that they had, so they uh, asked them to, uh, they, they uh, told the mother that she can join the father, because the father was there uh, before, and but they uh, asked the two boys to 
deported to they asked the authority to deport the two boys back to um, Syria. However, it is uh, President Roosevelt uh, interfered personally, and he uh, allowed them because it, he didn't think that two um, boys that can be separated, and he also met them later. So this is a story. Also, he put some um, uh, uh, historical facts uh, uh, to, uh, yeah, and uh, stories to illustrate that. Um, he also uh, researched uh, more stories about uh, many uh, biographies, um, uh, and also include them. Uh, however, so um, uh, in addition to his contribution to writing the early history of Arab Americans, um, this great scholar gave some credibility to stories and folk tales of immigrants as a viable source of information, especially when there are uh, no other source available. However, it took another half a century after Hippie to have a further uh, boost to credibility of storytelling as a vital source for historical writing. The breakthrough was achieved at the hands of Alexa Nav, uh, a, a professor uh, and historian um, who, was, uh, who was specialized in oral history and folk tales of early Syrian immigrants. Uh, she is called the mother of Arab American studies and is still the most quoted in the field. The research on Arab Americans uh, showed, uh, slowed down uh, in the following decades uh, after Hitti's book until 67. Many Arab scholars, including Nav, state that Arab-Israeli war and uh, uh, it was uh, and the loss of the rest of Palestine, which, which uh, aroused more hostility uh, towards uh, Arab community, triggered their interest in writing the um, history of Arab Americans to counter the polemics and stereotypes spread in the mainstream narrative. Tens of books were published, but the experience of early immigrants was always viewed as a challenging gap in the research. The turning point came with Alexa Naf's first book, uh, which set the foundation for the following uh, works on the subject. Uh, her book includes um, uh, animated details about the trip uh, by ship where, uh, where stories are healing and calming fear and pain. It shows the historian skills of storytelling and they present women as good storytellers as well. Uh, so you can see this is one of the uh, stories she uh, narrated. It gives very animated, very nice <coughs> of the, um, uh, uh, the, tra the travel and the trip in, the, in boats. Um, where women even sang and told stories. Uh, she also describes the Syrian letters in the American scene. Uh, she said in uh, 1911, the Syrian peddler, by then a familiar figure on, in American scene, captured the imagination of uh, Lucille uh, Baldwin Van Slyke, who portrayed him romantically and shrouded him in Eastern, Eastern mystery in her short story. Uh, Nav had driven throughout America con conducting oral inter interviews uh, she collected hundreds of stories, photographs, and artifacts directly from the first generation of immigrants or their families uh, from Greater Syria. Uh, the term she popularized actually in the field and she always used, uh, Greater Syria. Uh, she donated the collection uh, of artifacts and records to the uh, Museum of American History in Washington, D.C. Nav contributed to establishing stories and oral history as a academic and scholarly method of uh, chron chronicling uh, the lives of immigrants and also in historical studies in general. Uh, associative uh, objects of material culture and artifacts which, she, uh, which were kept for several generations included uh, personal and household objects, uh, musical instruments, uh, kitchenware and clothing. These artifacts were associated with events and tradition and were animated illustrations of stories and memories. Um, Helen Samhan, the former uh, executive director of Arab American Institute in Washington, stated some merits of NAF uh, work. Her ability to tell uh, uh, this story uh, was important in understanding the diversity of Arab American experience, even in scholarly uh, circles. Yeah? So um, I uh, summarized the main achievements of NAF work, uh, depending on uh, many um, uh, uh, commentators and people who reviewed uh, her work. Uh, the museum where her uh, collection kept and displayed also highlights her innovative usage of life uh, story and folklore uh, field work, which transformed, uh, transformed um, yeah, into uh, a narrative. Um, until the 60s, oral history was used to document, uh, they say, they, this is the museum and the museum um, uh, website. They also uh, had discussion about NAF's work. They say, uh, until the 60s, oral history was used to document the life stories of famous people predominantly men, but uh, NAF uh, uh, proposed study of the everyday man and woman, uh, 
uh, who left their homes and traveled to the United States to make new lives, combined uh, oral history practices with the techniques of folklore field work. The, result, uh, the resulting interviews recorded the experience of the immigrant generation in their own words, uh, which was uh, an, uh, an achievement also. The development in the field inspired many other historians to expand the practice and travel to the original towns where immigrants were born and lived before immigrating. Uh, Gregory Orphelia went to his uh, uh, original town of his ancestor. Um, they, uh, his family left in 1878, so he went to Homs and Arbeen. This is where her fami his family uh, used to be, and he collected lo lots of stories. He put them in a very nice um, uh, uh, writing because he's a historian, but in the same time, he's a poet and a novelist also. Um, uh, this is uh, what Amazon actually, uh, marketing his book, uh, described it as uh, it combines histori historical um, uh, research with vivid storytelling. Uh, the word storytelling and story now is a very uh, common word. Uh, it comes uh, on um, uh, writing history. Uh, the field now, uh, these developments in the field marks remarkable shift in academic research. Young historians of upon early Syrian immigrants demonstrate the devices of collecting and analyzing stories as part of their training and expertise. For instance, this is one of the uh, theses the, uh, I uh, uh, found in line for Hanadi uh, Hawada uh, was submitted as a dissertation, academic uh, dissertation. The abstract defined the methodology and content as this thesis will tell the story of the Syrian Lebanese immigrants. So it's a thesis, but it will tell a story. In Toledo from da da da. Introduction reads: I would like to especially uh, express my uh, gratitude to uh, Ms. Salim and Shams. And she said, without these stories, without their stories. Uh, this paper would uh, not have been uh, possible. Yeah? So story can be, stories can make uh, very uh, good uh, material for um, uh, historical research. The stories here are not only a device, but also a generator of large historical events. Uh, also, they repeated the same like Hetty, where the stories generated actually immigration sometimes, uh, prompted thousands of villagers to venture in search of gold. Uh, I think this was part of uh, universal history. It was uh, everywhere, but including historical Syria. One of her interviewees explains uh, that in uh, as 1890, some of the early immigrants returned home with the story and evidence of their uh, stunning and swift yeah, evidence. They, they, they also say the way they dress, the way they uh, buy things there, so people will um, uh, be convinced also that their story, story is correct and that they are very successful and uh, uh, also uh, quick, uh, they, have, uh, they are very wealthy. Uh, such episodes are usually followed by waves of, uh, of exodus, uh, she said. And since literary fiction is the treasure house of folk tales, uh, uh, personal and uh, communal stories and memoirs, um, some researchers were able to find uh, historical details of great value in the writing of immigrant novelists. <coughs> in her article, uh, in her article, uh, gendering, sorry, uh, Yes, in her article, Gendering Birth and Death in 19th Century Syria, Colony of uh, New York City, the sociologist uh, Linda Jacobs investigates uh, women and children uh, health situation and uh, women work uh, in the uh, medical sphere. In addition to her archival research, Jacob, Jacobs uh, extracted uh, data and evidence from literary uh, texts. Um, uh, investigating lung disease as one of the uh, causes of, uh, is it here actually? No. Uh, yes. Yeah, this is Linda uh, uh, Jacobs. She, she uh, quoted uh, Amin Rehani, um, uh, who wrote the uh, first uh, Arab uh, novel, Arabic novel, in, in uh, America. It's mainly an autobiographical novel. Um, it's called The Book of Khalid. He said, only one block east of um, Hudson River, the basement flooded every time the tide came in and um, uh, undated shop and home. The men had to save their goods before their persons. So he, he described, oh, this was all in Little Syria, the, the area that disappeared, but it uh, stayed uh, still a lot in um, uh, stories. Uh, though, so even sociologists, uh, they use uh, this. Uh, the, Last part is about fictional historiography. Uh, the, in fact, the Book of Khaled, which is quoted by Jacobs, is a gold mine for historians uh, of that period. Although it is the first novel of an uh, Arab-American um, writer in English, it is still largely unknown 
to Americans as well to Arab leaders. Uh, it was composed during a, a long visit, uh, visit by Rihani spent in the mountains of Lebanon. The autobiographical novel tells the story of two boys named Khalid and Shakib from Baal who immigrated together to the United States. The novel includes a uh, description of all uh, the four missing parts that I uh, identified at the beginning. The trip, the uh, arrival, the uh, early resettlement, uh, uh, the ship, it's everything. Um, uh, so, uh, yes, and Little Syria and uh, the work uh, uh, the, uh, of Earl of um, newcomers in peddling um, and as wandering um, salesmen. Uh, furthermore, the novel travels between the two countries, actually, uh, through the writer's memories and stories that voyage between the two worlds. Other novels that will be uh, contributing to the field were published recently, the observation of Nath and Jacobs about the invisibility of women in the coverage of the experience of early immigrants. So it, not only Arabs, uh, uh, but even in the, the media, uh, the American media, usually they, it was uh, more, uh, you can see, um, uh, uh, interviews with the uh, 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 men and boys more than uh, women. So they, th this is maybe uh, addressed recently in the writing of uh, um, writers now. Uh, in our sorry, I'm really sorry to interrupt. We should look at me sometimes. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. This is the this is the end. I'm, I'm just uh, saying the conclusion yeah. in a minute. Yeah. Uh, so this is the sister of Sidnaya, um, uh, Rose Ann uh, Kalister. Uh, uh, her uh, uh, story, the story of her family, is put in a fictional narrative uh, last minute. Social media contributed largely to combining written and visual culture and creating grounds for young generation to exchange and preserve stories and pictures. It is possible to view the stories of Syrian immigrants in text and picture in <coughs> websites and pages of uh, social media. The experience of early Syrian immigrants is also part of the American history and Arab <coughs> literature uh, research the stories and insights of in non-Arabic uh, sources. Uh, Hitti um, uh, included, uh, for instance, the uh, autobiography of Senator Gore uh, on the story of, um, uh, of the two Syrian boys and um, uh, also uh, Nav quoted the short story by the American writer. Uh, also, this uh, picture actually of Little Syria, this is a scene from Little Syria, this is by an American um, uh, artist, yeah, his name is there. Uh, so, this is the last uh, slide, and this is my conclusion and finding. Early Syrian immigrant stories and tasks and achievements, so providing alternative sources by uh, these stories and memoirs, etc., and <coughs> reconstruct this, the history of syro lebanese community to subvert the polemical uh, stereotypes about Arabs and to present the cultural wealth and identity of the Arab American community. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Haider. Sorry to have interrupted you. But if it's for the minutes. sake... Yeah, I... 15? No, 20. Really? Okay, thank you. No, I'm <laughs> three, thank you. Uh, so you have 20 minutes to explain more your point. Uh, with questions, yes, please. Yes. So we have one here. Let's go ahead, another one. So we have 10 minutes for questions. So we already have two uh, Thank you questions. very much for a very interesting talk. And um, I have two questions, and they are related. Um, as you were talking, you, you conflated the term Syrian with Arab. Uh, when, did the, when did the label Syrian um, in the United States uh, become Arab? Uh, America. Mm -hmm. When did that happen? And uh, the second part of this question is, um, Philippe Hitti says that, uh, about Bashalani, the first Syrian was a Lebanese. Yes. I'm interested in your take, your interpretation of what this meant for Hitti. Yes. Uh, uh, Hitti was, uh, I think <coughs> he, uh, uh, he published his book uh, first in uh, um, 1923 somewhere, but the the uh, uh, one which is uh, we have it now it's uh, 24. Uh, at that time, he insisted that uh, uh, throughout his book he insisted that uh, they, uh, on historical Syria. He the the whole um, uh, introductory part is about defining Syria as one consistent place. Even his folk songs is to say to see that it is um, um, the interconnection uh, between these cities. He defines it as a, a historical, natural uh, 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 territory and uh, uh, region uh, alone. And I think it was a very common um, 
popular idea at that time. Uh, I think the, the idea of Bilal Sham and historical Syria. I think the word Arab uh, came with the rise more nationalism and uh, maybe during the interwar be period uh, started and then after in independence more with the rise of nationalist movements. Uh, however, uh, Syrians, uh, yes, uh, then you started to have uh, modern Syria and Lebanon, Palestine, etc. But, but until um, uh, I think uh, the, the 40s uh, was common to call uh, it is, uh, uh, that it is uh, Syria. Uh, and uh, <coughs> concerning the research, uh, what I said is uh, uh, any research on Arab Americans, the first part of it, the first century, is a Syrian century. Because the first um, uh, people who uh, went to America in the, before uh, uh, 1920, almost all. If I want to say almost all, because I want to be objective. But all, they say all. All of them were Syrians. Uh, yes, uh, I think uh, it is very much the word uh, Arab. Uh, Naf started to use it after 67, mainly. 67 brought this word because they thought the, the polemics included everybody. And the Syrians felt the responsibility because actually they were the first to be there, and they established the, um, the idea so, um, uh, of uh, like the um, Arab community or uh, um, uh, identity, though it was Syrian at the end. But, but uh, 67 uh, was the uh, main motivation, even for them, the, word, the historians. Uh, Hickey didn't use very much the word Arab. He used Syria always. So he said the first, you say, I put it the first Syrian was a Lebanese. He considered, um, like all, um, uh, I think uh, it was the, the idea then, uh, Lebanon was the name of the mountain. Jordan was the name of the river, so that was historical Syria. Uh, but uh, uh, Naf, uh, sh the polemics after 67 were not against the Syrians, were against Arabs in general, but Syrians were included. So this is why they started to use the word Arabs, but they always, always uh, uh, continued to, to use the word Syria, especially when you research, as I, as I said, the first century. Yes. <laughs> Uh, please, I would like you to tell us a little bit more about Clinton Syria <coughs> and, and when did that disappear? You say it was in Manhattan and yes. then it disappeared. Uh, and uh, whether that is somehow maybe related to the, how is that related to political stereotypes, the stereotypes about Arabs? Where, uh, what, were, what were the kind of stereotypes that they had about the Arabs before uh, 1967 or during the, uh, Little Syria was not really uh, uh, alone, but uh, there were lots of demographic uh, changes in the uh, uh, big cities during the 40s and uh, 50s. So um, there were, uh, they were, yeah, more uh, quarters uh, replaced the old ones. Uh, maybe, I think some people would think that there was something in, because it's not only the Syrians, but also there were many minorities. Uh, uh, some of them also were there, um, uh, the, uh, the um, uh, area was demolished and uh, replaced by, uh, so the, the, the community will scatter. However, uh, actually, uh, Little Syria was the main uh, place uh, uh, where newcomers will go there. So they will find their, their relatives or people they know, and etc. But also, it was uh, many um, uh, Americans and other nationalities will go there because, as you see, I show it, 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 it was uh, uh, lots of places of uh, sociability. And even uh, the main writers we know about, actually, they were there. Amir Rihani was there. Zubran, they, they all went there. Uh, especially at the beginning, they were they used to have lots of gathering, also not only for dancing and singing and eating, but also even cultural uh, uh, events. Um, uh, so I think um, uh, yes, it was during the forties and fifties. Maybe there is a political element, but I wouldn't uh, think it is the only uh, reason. Um, uh, and the stereotype for. Um, uh, uh, Syrians were similar to uh, even uh, Italians, and many minorities suffered, Eastern Europeans suffered of these uh, uh, stereotypes. Uh, the Arab Americans mainly very much associated with the, uh, uh, yes, the Palestinian issue, so there, were, there was more uh, maybe hostility um, uh, towards them, uh, and uh, they, they worked. Uh, little Syria is the, also exists now in lots of narratives uh, of um, uh, non-Syrian non also 
non Arab uh, also writers. Uh, some new the so with the so thanks to the social media we start to know more. Uh, uh, if you put little Syria, you see some Americans speaking about also little Syria. Okay. Um, uh, can I ask yes. uh, Hajar? Sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, some of the texts you mentioned are they still in print or are these like which ones? Uh, I think I remember the the last one was Sayyid Naya of something. Yeah, this is a new. Actually, this is a pu published just a couple of months. Eighteen or a couple of months ago. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. This is very new, so this is what I wanted to mention recently. So women, because um, and, um, uh, there was always uh, uh, people complained that, uh, for of course, the, uh, this is your paper, women's uh, voice is very much suppressed, mm -hmm. uh, not only in the um, uh, Arabic uh, uh, resources, but also even in, um, uh, for instance, in uh, American media, when they relate the stories, they would go to the men to relate. So, so they tried to compensate uh, for that. So this is, uh, yes, this writer. Uh, told this, the history from her own point of view, view. However, in novel, which I call fictional, not me, I mean, I, but I categorize it as fictional historiography because it tells the untold history, the undocumented history. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Water. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Yes, who's next? Professor Mohammed, are you sitting here? No, I don't know. Okay. Uh, the third speaker is Dr. Mohammed Sanaullah Al Nadawi, uh, professor of Arabic in the Department of Arabic at Aligarh Muslim University, India. Uh, he is the author of several books. I cite a few of them here in Arabic and in English. In Arabic, Al-Itijahat Al-Wujudiyya fi al-Shiar al-Arab al-Hadid, Al-Arab fi al-Andalus, Muqarabat fi al-Tariq wa al-Adab, Mashahid wa Mutarahat fi al-Lugha wa al-Adab wa al-Thaqafa, published in 2010, Muqarabat fi al-Sard al-Arab al-Hadid wa al-Mu'asr, the latest one, I think, published in 2016, 2016. In English, The Arab Legacy in Latin Europe, 2004, and uh, The Arab Romance, Parnassus, in uh, 2006. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Anadawi is president of uh, India Award in 2007. Uh, and we are going to listen uh, to <coughs> his paper titled, yeah. Travelogue as Cross-Cultural Memory, Illustrations from India's Arabic and Urdu travelogues. Then uh, the floor is yours. I think there's uh, trouble in this projection. Uh, someone, perhaps, no, Ahmed, would you please help me? I think no one has to log in back. back. That's uh, I did, but I'm quite. Yeah, no one log in, and he will be able to log in. Yeah, <coughs> because he's already logged in. So. Ladies and gentlemen, let me start with uh, uh, thanks, a word of thanks for the organizers of this uh, Congress, International Congress, on a, such, a, such an important topic uh, to, to deliberate upon that uh, it revisits uh, the history, the geography, and uh, many other disciplines uh, of antiquity in uh, some. Uh, well-defined methodological perspectives. I thank them for inviting me to be part of this uh, academic uh, deliberation. Uh, my presentation is focused on uh, Thalassology as cross-cultural memory, illustrations from India's Arabic, Persian, and Urdu Hajjit travelogues. Well, uh, let's show off uh, a light number of uh, 
slides sir, besides some comments. Starting with the, the very advent of Islam and what was the very genesis of uh, travelogues, especially has travelogues uh, during successive Muslim rules in the, <coughs> in the Indian subcontinent. What has been the contribution of uh, the Muslim authors so through ages uh, in uh, local as well as uh, local languages like Urdu, uh, Hindi, English, etc. Besides uh, uh, Arabic and Persian languages, which have been language of course sometimes in the Indian subcontinent. So in India, we have more than 400 travelogues written in Arabic or, and Urdu alone. And if we are counting uh, the uh, travelogues which uh, have been which could be categorized as non-Hajj sector, non-Hajj travelogue. So the number would be equal or more than that. So it's around 1,000 pieces of works which are already published. A deliberate on the methodological perspectives of homogeneity, difference and critique when it comes to travelogues, cross-cultural perceptions and projections. When you talk about the Arabism and it's in the perspectives of, Arab, of legacy, it's legacy in India, of course we have a large number of ages. And most significantly, the Hajj travelogue or the works which have been produced in different languages in the Indian subcontinent uh, are related to these uh, uh, rules, it's starting from the Arab conquest, then the Ghaznavayas, the Ghorais, the slaves, the Khiljis, the Tughlaqs, the Sayyids, the Lodis, the Mughals, the Shartis, the Khandesh, the Bahmanis, the Adil Shahis, the Qutub Shahis, the Nizam Shahis, the Bengal Nawabs, the post independence India, etc. So when it is said that uh, the Indus, India is a subcontinent with a huge legacy of Arabism in terms of Arabic literature, Arabic disciplines, theological knowledge, etc. Again, it constitutes what could be categorized as the verb min tarikh adab al al Arabi, official part in India. And that actually happens to be one of the topics which we teach in the Indian universities when we teach about the Arabism in historical parlances. Well, there have been historic interaction between Arabia and India from times immemorial. In the Muslim ages, we have a large number of Muslim tra travelers, well-known Muslim travelers going to the Indian subcontinent and uh, giving details uh, related to democracy, demography, history, sociology, culture, teaching, even gastronomy, etc. of the Indian peoples. So, Sulaiman Tajir, Abu Zayd al-Sarafi, Abu Hassan al-Mas'udi, Abu Rahan al-Biruni ibn Battuta, and finally Ali Sadruddin ibn Ma'asum, ibn Ma'asum al dastaki al-Madani. These are some of the important uh, travel accounts of uh, the Arabian peoples who have visited India. Well, uh, Hajj technology actually constitutes uh, a major segment of a religious economy. Since Hajj Thalassology and its patronage in medieval India, from times uh, uh, dating back at least as we do find the uh, well recorded evidences in history, in history books, we find that the Mughal emperors, especially uh, uh, Emperor Akbar and Shah Jahan and Aurangzeb, they were very much concerned about the uh, Hajj and they patronized the Hajj at the estate level and sent uh, a number of his scholars. At the time, we, find, we do find a uh, number of, uh, of, of, of ladies belonging to the household of uh, the Nawab, the rulers of uh, the Mughal dynasty, uh, coming to the Arabian Peninsula for performing Hajj. And after that, we have a number of uh, scholars from uh, different states uh, who had embarked upon Hajj. So, when we're talking about uh, the uh, Hajj technology, we find a large number of, of uh, scholars. And if you classify them, we'll be finding them uh, among the scholars, among the rulers, among the men of letters, among the poets, among, among uh, other uh, persons. Well, in uh, pre independence India, we do find what is known as the, the colonial policy. The colonial policy of Hajj was in 1838, Alexander uh, Ogilvy, the first British consul and East India Company agent in Jeddah, uh, facilitated Hajj issues. The government policy was the government has no right to prevent any person who decides to do so from proceeding on pilgrimage. So here we find a continuity from the Middle Ages up to the British time, the pre-colonial time. 
The postcode in the time would define the continuation of this one, although there were the security concerns like uh, that which have been represented here. The Hejaz in, is the natural asylum for the fanatical Muslim exiles from India who may their, past, their lives in a, a congenial atmosphere of fanaticism. It was uh, told by by Tifrer of the Indian Foreign Department. So of course there were the concerns, but again there was uh, encouragement of Hajj travelogy uh, from the past uh, till present. The other concerns were related to the epidemics, like the cholera episode of uh, of 1865 that killed uh, 15,000 out of 9,000 pilgrims, destitute pilgrims. We to find uh, 3,000 Indian pilgrims in 1886. Uh, in, in Jeddah area, Arab revolt in 1916 had the harsh fights and post-war problems. Hajj and Britain's political propaganda, Indian Muslim soldiers, uh, pilgrims, where you find that uh, around 2,000 soldiers in Egypt participating in Hajj in 1918. As regards the seafaring in the Indian Ocean from tax immemorial, so this was the basic route that you find from uh, India. India. In India, we define in, in, in the pre-independent India, we do find Bombay, Surat, and Karachi as the three major ports of uh, transportation of the, Hajj, of the Hajjis, of the pilgrims from the Indian subcontinent to Arabia. We are Bombay, uh, which is still uh, stands as a significant uh, port of uh, of uh, transportation, it was known as Bab Makkah. Even Surat was known as Bab Makkah because of this uh, background. The Hajj logs, as it had quanti- uh, counted, more than 200, uh, four, four, 400, and non Hajj logs, uh, 400, and languages Arabic, Persian, and Urdu. If you classify them, you will find <coughs> scholars like Abdul Haq Muhaddis al Dihalawi, Shah Waliullah al Dihalawi, Rafi Ruddin al Muradabadi, Siddiq Hazan Khan al Qanoji. Uh, these are the foremost uh, scholars of uh, Arabism and religious sciences in, in India. They have performed Hajj and they have uh, contributed uh, towards this literature. The poets and, and uh, men of literature, we have uh, Nawab Mustafa Khan Shifta <coughs> with his uh, uh, Barak Awrad, Ata Hussain Fani, and we have Abdul Majid Dariyabadi, we have Shorish Kashmiri and others. The women travelers, we have, we have uh, Nawab Sikandar Begum, a uh, pilgrimage to Makkah, who represents the house of Bhopal. She was one of the rulers of Bhopal state. Nawab Sultan Jaha Begum, also the history of a pilgrimage to Hejaz. And uh, Amadul Ghani, Nur Nisa, Rahira Shirwani, and Sadhu Kazaki. These are the, uh, some of the important uh, female uh, Hajj travelers from in the Indian subcontinent. We have the rulers, ruler of Bhopal Nawab Sikandar Begum, pilgrims to Makkah in 1870, rulers of Bhopal Nawab Shah Jahan Begum, the history of a pilgrimage to Hejaz, 1909, Nawab Kalbe Ali Khan, the Nawab of Rampur in 1872, he was accompanied by famous Urdu poet Tab Dehlawi, who has written Khindile Haram, then Nawab Muhammad Umar Ali Khan of Basoda State. So, in recent Indian history, we defined four Nawabs, Nawabs here the, estate, the rulers of the kings, or the, or the chieftains who have performed Hajj and written their travelogues. They have cartographers like Nawab Muhammad Umar Ali Khan, Wazir Hussain, uh, and Sultan Dawood and Muhammad Abdul Rahim Naqshbandi. The which has Hajj travelogues which have been written in Arabic. Uh, it was written in Arabic originally or were translated. It is Abdul Haqq Muhaddis al Dehlawi, Jazbu Qulub al Adiyar al Mahbub. Then we have Shah Ali al Dehlawi, Fuyud al Haramain. Then we have Rafi al Din al Muradabadi, Arah al Hindi al Jazal al Arabiya. Then we have Sikand, Nawab Sikandar Begum of uh, Bhopal. It has been translated into Arabic as Muzakirat al Hilat al Hajj. We have Siddiq Hassan Khan Qanuji, Rihlat al Siddiq, Ila Baitullah al Atiq, or Ila al Balad al Atiq. Then we have uh, the Khaja Hassan Nizami's uh, Khaja Hassan Nizami Dehlawi's uh, travelog, Rihla to Khaja Hassan Nizami Dehlawi in Nusr wa Palestine wa Sham wa Hijaz, Tajiman Samir Abdul Hamid Ibrahim. We have uh, the travelog of Ghulam Rasul Mehl, uh, a Meher, it, was, it has been translated into Arabic as Bin Adab Rasail al Hindi al Hijaz. Then we have Safar Sa'adat of Amir Ahmed Dehlawi, we have uh, uh, Abu Hassan Ali and Nadwi in a number of travelogs. So, in these, uh, we do find a number of, a large number of, uh, of information. So, these travelogues are 
sort of uh, the treasure troughs of the historians when it comes to anything that is related to the history and uh, geography of India in the context of in the context of the religious uh, economy that we find between a uh, sort of shared uh, concern or shared sector between Arabia and uh, the the Arabian uh, and the Indian subcontinent. This is the picture of Nawab Sikandar Begum, who was the ruler of of, of Bhopal. Nawab Sikandar Begum, the travelogue entitled A Pilgrim to Mecca, recounts the events of the journey by Sikandar Begum in 1863, published in London in 1870. Divided into two books, the travelogue gives a geographical description of Arabia, the mosques in Mecca and Medina, the places in two cities, names of the peoples the Begum met, shrines and historical monuments, names of tribes, tribal chieftains, and even the Sheriff of Mecca who unfortunately had created some security and monetary problem for her. The, the, the Sharif, for example, asking for a particular amount of money as to make the book of, it makes the book of a great historical value. Uh, this is a photograph of the travelogue of Sikandar Begum, which was uh, published. Now, Sikandar Begum, of course, gives a large chunk of information which are very, very significant. Like, uh, you know, what is available in market, whether uh, the peoples of Mecca or the things which are prohibited in uh, uh, theologically in Islam are available uh, in Mecca or Medina or like this. For example, he says, uh, she says that wine is uh, publicly available but usually consumed by Turks or Indians in page number 115. Lack of schools contributed towards a growing number of uh, unlittered estate children, etc. The, uh, well, uh, what uh, strikes uh, a historian of when it comes to some uh, international trades uh, which uh, have uh, uh, become points of concern, of course, in modern times or also in antiquity, was the slave trade that was prevalent in Arabia at the time. At least uh, among the Indian uh, travelers, we will find two, two books of uh, paramount significance uh, produced by Indian pilgrims. One of them is Sikandar Begum and another is Nawab Sadiq Hassan Khan, Khan which uh, would be probed uh, later over here. We define a, a, a good account of uh, the details uh, uh, that uh, we find regarding the slave trade in Mecca. So here Nawab Sikandar Begum gives a lively account of slave trade in Mecca. The slave market, which was known as uh, an khasa, thrives in, the, in Dakka, Mecca, with a large variety of men and women of different ethnicities. She says African slaves are abundantly available in the market and sale is finalized with receipts. Slaves, men and maids alike from Georgia came to Mecca in Haji caravans to be purchased by inhabitants of Mecca and later sold to the pilgrims. Such masters last for two or three days a year. Some of them married the maid slaves and later divorced them if they decide to sell. The man is not married except in her first sale and never permitted to sit before her master. The exception is for the maid who has mothered a child from, his ma from her master. The aristocrats and nobles purchased the African and Georgian slaves and sent them to sacred places for manual services such as cleaning, lighting, etc. Some of <coughs> such slaves are provided with the basic livelihood for a year. The others purchased by less wealthy persons are employed for their personal services and are changed for new year every, uh, every year. Just as uh, we change our old clothes, but the maids who have, been, who have given birth to children are not sold again. Similarly, the African slaves are brought by people belonging to lower economic strata, who employ them for tough manual work such as cleaning, etc., carrying uh, heavy goods, etc., against two square meals a day and clothes for a year. Some people allow their maids slaves to go out of their home to attend the daily chorus, but charge them money for the same. The ill-tempered slave is sold immediately, but normally the slaves are loyal and sincere. After the hard work of fetching water, they build the, uh, the earning to their master just as to get just to get uh, two breads to eat. Well, here also we find some beautiful information regarding Indian rulers' concern to uh, to, to, to patronize these scholars in the field of translation of the Holy Quran. So at the time of uh, when she arrived at Mecca, she found that no translation of the Holy Quran was available in Turkish language. So realizing this, uh, this necessity, uh, she found a scholar, uh, a Dagestani scholar, and interested uh, uh, him to uh, prepare a translation of the Holy Quran. But, uh, when, uh, but to her dismay, when she discussed this idea with the Sharif of Makkah, the Sharif of Makkah discouraged her. 
saying uh, that uh, in uh, the logical terms, uh, that sort of initiative is to be discouraged. Because uh, he just emphasized that translation of the meaning of the Holy Quran is simply impossible and it has, been, it has not been uh, permitted by the scholars. So the idea was resisted or resisted by the Sharif of Makkah. That's why the idea was, uh, it was left. The Shah Jahan Begum's uh, This is the picture of Shah Jahan Begum, the ruler of Nawab. And uh, this is uh, the picture of uh, the first edition of the book, the Story of Pilgrim to Hejaz, in 1909. She again gives uh, lots of information like uh, how she stayed in Yambu near the coast sea and what was the rent that was to be paid and uh, this is the uh, okay this is the picture of uh, the ship that carried her to Makkah this was another ship that was carrying a German prince Turkish troops the view of Aden in the Red Sea between Jeddah and Yambu the Haram at the time this is one of the rare photographs we find in authentic sources. The numerical statement of Arabian currencies, what sort of currencies were available in Arabia at that time? She gives the value, the exchange rates in the Makkah market. Then the view of Adam, the tomb of Eve in Jeddah, the tomb of Eve of, uh, of the Dishrine, the fort of Makkah that was over there at the time, the Safa, and uh, the arches, etc., this sort of stuff, uh, details, uh, building details, archaeological deta details in the holy city, the Hanafi Musalla, the Dakhali area, Mount Arafat, Turkish troops, part of Port of Yambo, etc. This is the Nawab Kalb Ali Khan of uh, Rampur who had performed the Hajj and his uh, uh, travelogue is known as the Qindil Haram although it was prepared by the person, the poet uh, accompanying him Nawab Siddiq Hassan Khan Kanoji his uh, travelogue has been translated into uh, it, is, it was uh, originally written in Arabic Reklat al-Siddiq al-Bayt al atiq it has several uh, publications Uh, well, he says in, in some of the comments, he says, "وَقَدْ شَهَدَ فِي سَفَرِ هَذَا عَجَائِبُ رَأَيْتُ فِيهَا عِدَةَ مَصَاعِبٍ وَاَفْتَبَرْتُ النَّاسَ وَمَيِّزْتُ سُفَاءَ مِنَ الْأَكِيَاسِ وَرَقَدْ رَأَيْتُ مِنْهُمْ الْإِسْرَافِ الْمَنْهِيَ عَنْهُ فِي طُولِ الْذُّلُوِ وَالْتِيَابِ وَغَيْرِهَا حَتَّى رَأَيْتُ الْعَمَائِمَ كَالْأَبْرَاجِ وَالْكَمَائِمَ كَالْأَخْرَاجِ." That sort of language he uses. حتى رأيت العمائم كالأبراج والكمائم كالأخراج وبدع لا تحصى ومحدثات لا تستقصى فرحم الله القرآن اشترب عن ذلك وصانا نفسه عنا هناك ونهى القوم عن هذه المناحي والمنكرات وما إلى ذلك This is the travelogue of Rafi Udin al-Muradabadi Rafi Udin al-Muradabadi This travelogue has been translated into Arabic from Urdu and this Urdu translation was originally done from Persian Again he refers to the Nakhasa uh, phenomenon that is slave trade. Kaman al Abid wal Jiwari al Habshiyat Yuba'un of Yusuf al Nakhasata. He gives us another account, a peculiar account of uh, the sociology and social values in Hejaz, especially prevalent in Makkah. He says that, with the Gariba and the Mardam of Ashraf led the Zawajun, why never the Saron of Jiwari al Habashiyat, with the Sarat Umahatam Habashiyat Mudukurun, or Sarat Bishra to Ashraf al Lot al Hadr al Samra, Kaman al Banat Ashraf, Beni Zayd al Layat al Zawajun, Layat al Zawajna. So it was the first hand account that we find from uh, in, in an authentic Indian source about uh, some so social problems and customs prevailing, prevailing in Haramain. Khwaja Hassan Nizami Dehlwi, who happened to be a Sufi master of, uh, uh, of, uh, of a great significance because he represents the, the, the Sufi order of Sheikh Nizamuddin Awliya Dehlwi. Uh, Sheikh Nizamuddin Awliya Dehlawi was the Sufi uh, master in the chain of uh, the Chishtiya order, the late Chishtiya order, and we, we had uh, initiated uh, an order, a particular order, that, and this order is known as the Nizamiya order in, in Delhi. So he had uh, gone to Hejaz and uh, other places. This is the Urdu, Urdu original work of uh, Safar Nama his uh, travelog. This is the Arabic translation of uh, Khaja Rehla Khaja Hassan Nizami Adelui in Nasr. 
he gives us a large number of uh, uh, you know uh, pictures and uh, uh, cartographic uh, details uh, about the things he, he saw in Egypt like the Egyptian posted in postage that was prevalent uh, at the time Egyptian postage Nizami and uh, Egyptian with an Egyptian family dinner the pyramids the, the picture of pyramid the Sphinx Milan the Nabobi in Egypt it was celebrated, Church of the, of the Holy Sepulchre, uh, the pulpit, member of Omar ibn Khattab in Quds, tomb of tombs of Prophet Ibrahim, Yaqub, Ishaq, and Yusuf, Yusuf, the king of Egypt, Moses' uh, civil, uh, celebrations in Al Quds, hanging the stone in Al Quds, Arabi with the Torah in Quds, Nizami with the Turkish governor of Al Quds, Nizami in the mosque of King Solomon, Umayyad mosque in Damascus, the Sufi music of Malawi order, that is the Dervish dance, the Dervish dance, the tomb of Saladin in, 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 uh, in uh, Damascus, the Kurd, uh, Kurd Dervish, the Turkish coins, etc. And we have uh, Amir Hassan uh, Ahmed uh, Alawi, uh, and his uh, devlog has been translated into English, that is very significant, uh, with the name of Safar Saadat. The narrative ran into five, six pages on days that were eventful. Why it is brief, containing not more than 50 words on, on other days. Diary noting carries fascinating, insightful, cultural, political, and economic aspects of the contemporary life and reveal his own views on several global issues of tremendous significance. About Arab women, he found the violence irresponsible, exploited. May my countrymen have the foresight to stay clear of these Muslims who are not present in Makkah during the Hajj and leave their clients to, defend, to fend for themselves. And these views have been echoed by the earlier, uh, earlier tailors. So, in epilogue, we can say that Muslims in India have written hundreds of uh, thousands of books uh, in a number of Indian and South uh, Asian languages in a plethora of conventional and modern academic and literary, literary disciplines. The Hajj uh, Thalassology illustrated in uh, thousands of books, uh, hundreds of books, uh, tracts and travelogues uh, unveils the religious, social and academic beauty created by Indian Muslims with infused cross-cultural memory. Over 400 travels written each on Hajj and non-Hajj themes constitute a legacy to reckon with in the domain of international travel literature. And finally, such travelogues serve as valuable sources of information and views on history, geography, politics, society, economy, international trade, uh, numismatics, diplomacy, cultural, gastronomy, and culinary arts, dialectology, religiosity, and literatures of Arabia in general, and Hijaz in particular, that help us revisit, reconstruct, and retrospect questions of memory, historicity, and coexistence. Thank you very much. Well, this has particular and practical relation to the Hajj policy of the encouragement given by the, uh, the, the, the rulers over the ages, especially the, uh, the Mughal rulers. They were concerned with the safety of Hajj. And uh, at the time, uh, at the colonial era, uh, era the uh, Arabian Peninsula, and especially that route that runs between uh, Bombay uh, and Bombay Surat and Aden, it was protected, patrolled by the uh, by the British forces. So they were concerned with the safety of uh, the pilgrims. <coughs> so the uh, British policy, the British had to uh, formulate a policy that would not be antagonizing the Muslims, providing them safe passage, <coughs> protection. That's why uh, their uh, uh, commissioner was uh, known as the, the protector of Hajj. So. This was a continuity of this phenomenon amid the apprehensions of the British that uh, these, the, uh, these Muslims coming for Hajj into the Holy Land would uh, be conspirators uh, 
uh, would be conspirating with the other forces and doing something against uh, the British interest in uh, India. So that's why uh, their approach would be fine, balanced, sort of balanced approach. They didn't want to antagonize the Muslims, but again, didn't uh, the, uh, left, leave the gate open for all and sundry for this perspective, for this purpose. Okay, uh, let's go to that. Yeah, I have two points. Would you mind switching back to the image of the Umayyad Mosque in Damascus? Because I'm very much interested in this building. And it seems to me that there weren't the mosaics, if, if I wasn't mistaken. I just want to have a closer look. Yeah, in the Khaja Hassan and Amis. Yes, here it is. Okay, thank you. Um, the second point I want to raise is um, who, were, who was the audience to these several travelogues, i.e. Hajj travelogues to Mecca? And yeah, why were they written? Can you say something about this? <coughs> With one example or two examples, you didn't mention the audience uh, in, in your presentation. Okay, uh, some of these uh, uh, travelogues, uh, especially the travelogue of Khaja Hassan Nazami, yeah. uh, it was written in Urdu language, and uh, it is the language of the masses in the Indian subcontinent. So if you're talking in terms of the audience, so the, uh, the audience counted for millions. There were millions of audiences. And since uh, this figure, especially uh, Hassan Nizami, uh, happened to be representing the Nizami order, so means uh, he was uh, uh, the, the, the head of a Sufi center. He happened to be a, 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 a mystical guide of the millions of peoples. So of course, the audience was immense. And he wrote it for his followers to, yes, to, yes. Know, to know which, which way to take or how to yes, take. Yes, yes. It showed the way, it yeah. showed the way and uh, showed the, uh, the examples to be followed and the dangers which are to be avoided, etc. Besides uh, recording uh, the historical information, geographical inform information uh, for, 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 the, uh, for future generations. Did the travelogues also have a religious benefit for the writer? Do you earn, do you earn positive religious credit by writing a travelogue about your Hajj to Mecca? Of course it was like that. Because when uh, a, tab a traveler undertake a, a journey to Makkah and Medina, etc., so it is part of the religious economy, and this religious economy has immense appeal among the masses. So it benefits him even and, and the other peoples in terms of religiousity, and also in terms of uh, of attacking the people to a particular uh, denomination of spirituality. It might be especially true in regard to uh, Sheikh Khaja Hassan Nizami because he was representing the Nizami order. Okay, uh, no more questions? Mm. I'm not sure that this one is the uh, uh, I'm also not sure, <coughs> but I didn't want to raise that point because that would bring us in a... Yeah, because it's mostly in, uh, uh, I think, in uh, <coughs> um, the Muslim world, in the exhibition, uh, the museum, the Moscow Museum. It has the Mamluk style of architecture with exactly. it. Like, this has been produced. This has been reproduced from uh, this uh, first uh, edition of uh, Tavlog, Khaja Hassan Nizami, Babat Siyah Hate Mr. Philistine Shah Mahijaz, in the year 1911. And it was printed, printed in 1923. Jumada Ukhra. Mutabak February 1923. I have reproduced uh, this slide from this uh, Urdu edition of uh, the travelogue. 
probably was misnamed in the book, you know, mis mistitled. I tried to find it. Uh, it has been written that uh, it is. Uh, دمشق کی جامع اموی اور وہ منارہ جس پر حضرت عیسیٰ اتریں گے یعنی الجامع الاموی فی دمشق والمنارہ التي ينزل علیہ سیدنا عیسیٰ علیہ السلام ادو المکتوب اللغة الاردیہ فی نفس الصفحہ شکریہ بہت شکریہ Nesma Asakan teaches Arabic language and translation at the University of Palermo and coordinates a project on the methods of teaching Arabic language in Italy. She is a member of Union of Union Européenne des Arabisons et Islamistes. Her research interests cover Islamic civilization and the status of women in Egypt, contemporary Islamic feminism, and the question of gender and hermeneutics in the Quranic text. She did her undergraduate studies at uh, Ayn Shams University, Egypt, where she received a BA in Italian language and literature in 2007. She worked as a teaching assistant of Italian language at uh, Messer University of Science and Technology until uh, 2013. In 2014, she obtained an MA in modern languages and literatures of East and West, West from University of Palermo. In 2018, she obtained her PhD in Islamic civilization from La Sapienza, University of Rome. And uh, Dr. Uh, Esakan uh, is going to present a paper titled The Alexandrian Reality in the Fictional Stories of uh, Fosca, Cialenti, uh, Cialenti, and Ibrahim uh, Abdul Majd. Okay. Perhaps you are going to pronounce the first name better than I did. Okay, thank you. So let me first thank um, the AUS and uh, Abia, Dr. David Robinson. Special thanks to Dr. Noel Sharp, friend of mine also, and all the teamwork of Abia. I really enjoyed conference with you. <laughs> You're very kind always with us. So um, today I'm going to talk about a city that has uh, always attracted many uh, persons. So travelers, writers, and poets remembered it in their writings. <coughs> it's Alexandria, the eternal city of Alexander the Great. It's Bab el Shark, the door of the East, Madinat al Fanar, the city of the Pharaoh, and Arus al Bahr, as Egyptian used to say, the mermaid of the Mediterranean Sea. Alexandria represents a synonymy for literature production. It's the city where different people lived and lived traditions and stories that tell about their lives. These elements provide rich material to writers to weave storytelling. I will talk about two novels. The first one is Courtyard in Cleopatra or Cortina Cleopatra by the Italian writer Fausta Chalente. The second one is La Ahad Yanam fil Askandria, or No One Sleeps in Alexandria, <coughs> by the Egyptian writer Ibrahim Abdel Majid. Shalente lived in Alexandria for almost 20 years with her husband in the first uh, half of uh, the 20th century. Uh, and Majid, a writer and novelist, is Alexandrian in origin. Both of them have novels set in Alexandria during the first half of the 20th century. In uh, 1936, Chalente uh, uh, published The Courtyard, and in 1996, uh, Maj uh, Abdel Majid published his La Ahad, Yanam The Italian novel depicts the life of the European Levantines who, who lived in Alexandria between the two wars. The Egyptian novel represents the city since the outbreak of the Second World War until the defeat of Germany. The focus is on the Egyptians, especially those who immigrated to Alexandria from Upper and Lower Egypt 
besides local people. The aim of this paper is to compare these two novels to show up the characteristics of Sharent and Latin Majid storytelling, how did they represent the <coughs> reality, and how the personal experience is part of their uh, fictional stories. To keep the time, my focus would be on uh, three uh, elements, character, spaces, and the representation of the city in uh, the two novels. Um, in uh, the first uh, part of the talk, I will summarize the plot of each novel. In the second part, I will focus on the comparison, which will show how the city could gather two writers that never met, but could get in touch among their storytelling. Uh, Courtyard in Cleopatra tells the story of Marco, a young Italian who left Italy to go to Alexandria looking for his Greek mother. Marco was, uh, was born there in the famous district of Latarin, and after he was born, the Italian, uh, his Italian father decided to abandon his wife and return to Italy with his son. In Italy, the son lived a happy childhood. When his father died, he decided to return to Alexandria to find a mother that he never knew. After a long journey, he arrived in Cleopatra courtyard, uh, a narrow and closed space located on the edge of the city, um, a kind of melting pot of different races Greeks, Italians, Armenians, all lived quietly in Alexandria. Once arrived, Marco began his adventure in the city. Uh, because of his lazy character, he didn't like to work, so he spent his time going around and discovering the city districts. The protagonist fell in love with Dina, daughter of a Jewish Fourier. This relationship brought him to uh, the Levantine bourgeoisie uh, that he would hate and refuse. On the other hand, he found a friend, Kiki, that was an Arab girl with whom Marco discovered the exotic places of Alexandria, like the white beaches, the blue water, the great salt lakes, and uh, the desert of Mariut, the life of the farmers, the Bedouins, and the wild nature of the desert. Uh, main themes in uh, this uh, novel is the Levantine bourgeoisie, uh, it's, it is a frequent theme in the work of she, Fausta Chalente. Uh, she was wife of a Jewish Italian who belonged to the European Levantine elite of Alexandria at, ta at the time. And despite being one of this class, Chalente criticized them in her work. Her criticism goes through two levels. On the one hand, she criticized the Levantine bour uh, bourgeoisie uh, that despises and exploits the poor and the marginalized Levantines. On the other hand, she highlights the marginalization and total exclusion of the Egyptians uh, by both rich and poor uh, uh, Levantines. So could we say that the author has a neutral position toward everyone? It seems that Chalente rejects any hierarchical attitude both among uh, the Levantine community and between them and uh, uh, the Arab of uh, Alexandria, as she, she called him. She, she doesn't call him uh, the Egyptians. Uh, Chalente represent uh, this, uh, try to represent this reality with sincerity. So she says, daily life was incredibly sweet and easy, and the Levantines posted it as if it, uh, uh, as if it was all their merit and their right without looking around and without even bothering to notice that the mass couldn't absolutely enjoy those privileges. On the contrary, I saw how miserable that milled and peaceful people was, a people that was pressed by the hand of colonialism besides the shameful complicity uh, of the very rich and fa uh, famous ruling class. Laha uh, Dinam fil Iskandariya is a historical social novel. It tells the story of Majid Din and his wife who left their village in uh, the Egyptian countryside, fleeing to Alexandria because of, blood, uh, because of a blood felt. From a small space, they go to live in a metropolis with people of different language and religion. It was few time before the, uh, the Second World War. Majid Din and his wife were devoted Muslims. Once in Alexandria, the couple went to stay in Ghit al uh, a poor but beautiful district located in the southern part of the city. The story narrates the relationship between cops and Muslims, young and old persons, 
immigrants from everywhere in Egypt, as well as uh, uh, local people. Like Chalente, the author uh, pays more attention to his fellow countrymen, but he doesn't ignore the foreign communities. The focus is on the coexistence in, uh, I quote uh, Abdel Majid, this great white city that embraces all the people uh, of the whole world without complaining. Majiddin met Damian, a southern Copt who left his town due to family problems. Uh, they became close friends. They were often exchanging discourses on the meaning of life, diversity, and religion. But the fiction goes beyond the religion and the ethnic diversity and focus on human relationship. So uh, the main themes here is uh, one of the, the main topics is uh, the inter-ethnic conflict between the sons of uh, the same country, between Southern and Byzant Saida wa Fallahin, who immigrated uh, to Alexandria, and sometimes between uh, Muslims and Copts. The author uh, brings the reader into an interactive society which was based on diversity. His goal is to overcome the limits of diversity and focus on human relation in the present and in the past. So now we can see the uh, common points between the uh, two authors. Um, so both uh, courtyard uh, in Cleopatra and no one sleeps in Alexandria gives, uh, give way to the so-called Muhammadiyin, or uh, that's to say the marginalized people, those who live in society without anyone listening to their voices, poor and uprooted living teens and despised, despised uh, exploited Egyptians find opportunities to be seen and heard by Shalint and Abdel Majid. The shoe, uh, the shoe shine boy, the seamstress, the servant, the boy who sells necklace of fresh jasmine, and many other uh, are part of uh, the marginalized local class of Alexandria. Shalinda found in them an emotional dimension uh, that made her close to the different uh, but stimulating world of the Egyptians that she describes in these wars. They were not false, as almost everyone claimed. On the contrary, they were modeled by a polite religion and by an ancient civiliz civilization, and they were duty bound to uh, re respect that. Should I have shown superiority or arrogance only because I was white? Uh, then we can say that the storytelling of uh, Shalente is influenced by a personal and subjective point of view. Uh, no one sleeps uh, in Alexandria, um, represent the city of the Egyptians, as I said, um, represent the Egyptians who, according to Abdel Majid, are mentioned in Alexandria quartet of Lawrence Durant, just to complete the image. Uh, as an Egyptian writer, he affirms that making of Egyptians the main characters of novel was inevitable because the European literature ignored them. This consideration is thought also by Charente, who admit that European, Levantine or not, didn't have or even refused to have any contact with the indigenous po population, apart, of course, the servants, the suppliers, the workers. Europeans and Levantines used the term indigenous with contempt as if they were talking about an inferior race made of slaves. Like Shalente, the protagonist of Abdel Majid, are uh, one of the, the protagonists uh, are uh, the Muhammadiyin, the marginalized. Uh, he said that weak people are close to his soul. Uh, he lived among them and saw how they couldn't create their own life and everything that was happening around was bigger and stronger than them and determined their life. Abdel Majid tells the story of the railway <coughs> workers who work in silence without complaining and uh, despite the hard work uh, in their free time, they love together and uh, they make fun of their uh, life and their disappointment. The, the, the idea of lover, the but uh, happy workers also is present in courtyard in uh, Cleopatra in a scene where the author describes how the poor people who work on the boats try to resist the childness by singing. The difference between Chalente and Abdel Majid is that Chalente gave voice to an unusual medium 
for Italian literature for the law of the last century, as a contemporary writer, Abdel Majid in his state frames his work in the literature of marginalized people, which he also called as a body literature. <coughs> As for foreigner, foreigners, uh, Abdel Majid gave them place, especially when he talks about history of uh, Alexandria. He doesn't exclude the cosmopolitan nature of the city. Nevertheless, cosmopolitanism is not the core of his fiction. Thinking Alexandria just as cosmopolitan city ruins its reality. Through the narrative act, uh, Abdel Majid refers to the history and goes back to the time of Alexander the Great and his dream to build an eternal city. When he talks about history, Majid uses a very interesting technique or uh, in narrative technique. It is uh, the discursive and uh, dialectal techniques. The most important historical uh, events of Alexandria are told in the dialogues between Omar Hamid, <coughs> the poor uh, green grocer, and Zahra, the wife of the protagonist. Uh, in uh, No One Sleeps in Alexandria, the story is set in three main spaces, Majd uh, Din Towns, Alexandria, and the Alamin Desert. The plot takes place in the southern part of the city, in the poor district. Uh, it, occur, it occurs around Terat al Mahmudiya, and Abdel Majid maps districts that lie outside Western thickest quarters on the other side of uh, the Mahmudiya Canal and on the other side of the railway tracks. Quarters with semi rural names like Kafr Ashri and the Little Ainab that do not even figure in A.M. Forster's Alexandria A History and a Guide. The author uh, clues, uh, choose, uh, sorry, choose spaces that have never attracted the people who visited Alexandria in search of uh, the myth. Carmuz is the most uh, described uh, district in the novel. Uh, there the writer was born and raised. It's a very historical district. In old times, Carmuz was called Rachtos. It was the land which Alexander the Great decided to link to the island of Pharos. In the Italian novel, the main space is the courtyard. Some scenes take place outside the courtyard, uh, on the beaches of Ibrahimiya, or in the art quarters, like Shadbi, Ramla. Uh, also, Sharenghi prefers to set the story in poor and the traditional Alexandrian uh, quarter. So both authors describe Alex the Alexandrian reality uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, according to Fausta Charente, the Alexandrian reality depicted by European writers, such as Lawrence Dorrell, was more imaginary than real, more colorful than cloudy, and more mysterious than it ever was. Charente and Majid agree that the European literature reveals uh, mm, only the exotic part of the city and highlight the foreign presence, excluding the Egyptian reality. Both of them try to depict it, uh, the city in its true image. <coughs> Nevertheless, we can deny that they show subjective imagination to, uh, due to the personal <coughs> experience. So, uh, the Italian writer reconstructs the missing part in the Alexandrian puzzle. Uh, she highlights the multi ethnic aspects without neglecting the Egyptian component, which was. Uh, numerically superior. This is what makes her work different in European literature on Alexandria. Uh, she described the luxury uh, of the European neighborhood, uh, but she couldn't hide the miserable reality of the poor and uh, barefoot peasants. She doesn't let herself be enchanted by the Baroque fiction, which was completely separated from uh, con concrete reality uh, of, Alex, of, of Alexandria. <laughs> Um, so, um, as for uh, European literature on Alexandria, Abdel Majid claims that it, it uh, excludes native people. However, he says that Alexandria is a city of many faces. Every writer could see one of them, but all of them agree that the city is full of worries, movements, sadness, and uh, happiness. It's the case of all the cities of the port. For these reasons, uh, Abdel Majid wanted to emphasize the Egyptian view of the city uh, beside the cosmopolitan uh, aspect. So, um, for Abdel Majid, uh, Alexandria or uh, cosmopolitan Alexandria is a city of the world with Egyptians, foreigners, Muslims, Christians, and all uh, the 
ethnicities and religions. Uh, Alexandria was a piece of Europe in food, clothes, architecture, and more. For me, such, interwe uh, such interweaving is uh, the reason why the city was attractive. However, Abdel Majid has a subjective <coughs> imagination of the city due to, due to his origin. His identity speaks up uh, in, the in the narration. Carmoz is the quarter where he grew up. His father was one of the railway workers that he talked about. Uh, and for me, his point of view, uh, which comes from the inside, uh, makes his fictional story one of the most readable storytelling about Alexandria. What unites Majid and Chalente is the attention to marginalized groups. Both of them illustrates how these people defeat their tears and disappointment, smiling and showing trust and patience for tomorrow. Both of them search for places which are located on the edge of the city. There are places also that uh, don't exist anymore, especially in uh, Chalente, like as Dust Roads and uh, Lake of uh, Hadra. So the, to the story uh, telling of Chalente and Majid is, uh, for me, a bridge between two worlds, East and West, that sometimes, uh, honestly, seems to uh, don't want to, to meet sometimes. So, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Dr. Desman. It looks like uh, okay, we are... Sorry to interfere, but because sorry. of the interest of time, we don't have uh, no, for uh, questions. Uh, a lot of... Like, maybe you can take one question or two question max, but they should be short questions. Okay, sorry for that. Uh, yes. You have a question and we for can, me? We can continue even the discussion uh, in the co uh, coffee okay, break. Right. We I think... <laughs> okay. Uh, I just want to uh, um, uh, ask about the image of the 11 time people, which are uh, same people I talked about from historical Syria, Syria, Lebanese, and Palestinian uh, and Jordanian. Uh, you said that the writer uh, equated uh, uh, Arabs with Egyptians. She said Arabs of uh, Alexandria means the Egyptians. Me, she she, she means the, the, the Egyptian people, so she but, but not the Arabs. 11 time Arabs. No, no, no. Okay. No, no. But, but they didn't, she, she doesn't use the, the term Egyptian. Yes. <coughs> uh, yes, I, I find this a bit strange because uh, the Arab nationalism actually was established at the hands of the Lebanese. And they moved actually the Renaissance from Syria, uh, sort of from Syria and Lebanon, which was the uh, birthplace of the Renaissance to Egypt. So the, the other things, they were not presented, uh, that they, they actually created the, Egypt, the, the, the Renaissance in Egypt movement. Uh, so yeah, uh, Foster Chalente has uh, uh, um, a lot of uh, novels set in Alexandria, and um, I I thought about this word uh, actually uh, this morning, and I I asked myself why why she uh, used the, the term Fallah uh, or Fallahin uh, or in transcription because the, the the novel is in Italian, mm -hmm. and she used the term Arab and not Egyptian. So I decided to read also the other novels set in Alexandria to to see if this is a consistent thing in the other novels or not. And uh, this is a question that I I made. Yes. Yeah, because they moved their theaters and their newspapers and publishing houses. George Zidan Al Ahram was established by Cyril Lebanese. Yeah. And so she didn't see from all this nothing. Except. Yeah. This is very interesting also because another um, another point that I criticized in uh, Charente, uh, even if I, I still didn't read all her novels, that she talks always about uh, marginal when she talks about uh, Egyptian. They are also they are always ignorant, marginalized, poor people. So uh, I don't know why I, I want to know why this choice. Why always why always talking about marginalized and how? Mm, however, all these uh, mm, nationalism and the projects and the journals and all this uh, cultural life that uh, was already in the first half. Uh, of uh, the 19th century, uh, she she doesn't talk about other uh, aspects of the city or of the Egyptians. Yeah, right. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think we have a coffee break for now. Uh, I have to make one announcement. Um, uh, we decided.